Today we're talking about lenses for wedding photography. today at White Rabbit in uh, Waterloo. Very nice day. Quick note, I am moving all of my course content from Patreon over to a new website. I'll talk more about this at the end of it, but just know that if you're watching this, there's probably still a few of the 100 founding spots available. When I launched Patreon a couple of years ago now, there was a founding member slot, it was $10, a lot of people got into it, then it closed forever, then it was $20, that closed forever, then it was $30, that closed $40. Uh, now, if you wanna get in on the new website, it is $6.58 per month if you sign up for the annual. Uh, if you get one of the founding member slots, Slots. There's only 100 available, so get on that right now. And if you're a Patreon member, I'm going to be posting all of the content that I would usually be doing on Patreon on the new site. I'll cross post for a little bit, but it will all be eventually on the new site. So link in the description below if you want to find that. Back to the patio, white, white rabbit. For lenses, there are a lot of different options and a lot of different numbers that are very confusing in the beginning. Not all lenses are created equal and they all do different and unique things. Well, it would be nice to have something that just did everything that went all the way from wide angle to super telephoto and did it in low light. The physics just don't really quite exist for that. Or if they did, it would be a huge telescope they'd have to carry around. So you really do want to select the style of photography that you want to do and find the lenses that best complement that. These lenses are called primes, so they do not zoom. You might be familiar with something like a 24 to 70 or the equivalent in full frame terms. I'll speak mostly to full frame in this video. But if you're on a crop sensor camera, that kit lens, that 24 to 70, might have numbers like 16 to 35 or 16 to 55. The second number that is equally as important, I would say, as the focal range is the f-stop number, the aperture number. And the smaller the number basically means it lets in more light. So these primes, they are, I prefer them personally because for weddings specifically, they let in a heck of a lot of light. So this is a 1.4, which means that if you're in a dark environment, it is really no problem whatsoever. This is also a 1.4, which means again, lots of light. And this is a 2.8, which is totally acceptable as well. There's one lens that I do not have with me and it is the super wide, which is something like a 15 to 35 or even wider in some cases. And in weddings, I just discovered that I don't use it a whole lot. Uh, I, I find that 24 is usually as wide as I'll ever go. Uh, and anything beyond that is usually a special case. So if I know that I'm going into a ceremony and there's going to be 300 people in a small location and I'm gonna have to somehow get a photo, a group photo of everyone, in that case, I will bring the super wide, but usually I just bring a 24 with me and absolute worst case, you can actually do a panorama. So rather than shooting with a super wide, you can just turn this on its side and use the 24 millimeter lens and just take a lot of frames, merge them together in Lightroom and you can actually build a super wide shot from that. Your f-stop and your aperture number also has to do with the depth of field. So the lower the number, the less depth of field you're going to get, which is kind of what you're seeing here. This is a 24 millimeter lens and you're seeing that I'm in focus and the background is nicely out of focus. And that is because we're shooting this at, what is it, 1.4? Yeah, because we're shooting it at 1.4. If I was on something like this 85 millimeter, more portrait style telephoto lens, the background would be even more blown out and just fade really kind of into nothing. Your depth of field is also affected by the focal length. So if you're shooting an 85 or 70 to 200 and you're all the way at 200, you're going to get a lot less uh, background detail and everything's going to be a lot, a lot creamier and a lot, a lot more blurry. Whereas if you're on the wide end, you still can get that separation. It's just, you have to get really close to your subject. So if you really want to get minimum depth of field, what you want to do is you want to be on the longest lens you possibly can at the lowest f-stop number and as close to your subject as you possibly can. All of those principles also take place if you want that nice depth of field with a wider angle lens. Now to speak specifically about millimeter length, uh, this is a 24 millimeter f1.8 lens that's usually on my second camera body pretty much every single wedding. Uh, sometimes I'll swap it out with a 35 millimeter prime. Um, this lens is specifically great for weddings. One, because I can control it up the field. So if I walk into a busy space that there's just a lot going on, like a bridal getting ready room, then I can make the background disappear a little bit. And also if it's a small space with a lot of people, I can get away with just using this. My main lens on a wedding day is usually this 85 millimeter F1.8. 
1.4 lens and I specifically love it because it allows me to get a lot closer to my subject without actually moving or, or zooming in on them. Um, that it just comes naturally zoomed at 85 millimeters, so it's a fixed focal length, you, you don't get to zoom. But the benefit is that I can get that 85 millimeter in an aperture of 1.4, whereas if it was in a zoom, it would be more like an f2.8 or an f4, which would mean more more background detail and also, also motorcycles, motorcycle brake. And also I'd have to go up on my ISO a little bit if we found ourselves in a darker environment. And with these lenses at 1.4, I can definitely get away really even in a candlelight situation uh, with a newer camera body, not even a brand new one, anything that's really come out in the past five years and a prime like this and you can get away really in candlelight, which is really cool. Now, you might ask yourself, the 24-70 kind of sounds like the, the best of all worlds. You can just zoom around and you can get every single shot that you want from the day. And well, in theory, it sounds great. I find that I just like the look and the feeling of the images that come off prime lenses better. There's no right or wrong when it comes to this. I find that I get a little bit lazy when shooting a 24 to 70, uh, and I zoom when I should be walking. And another thing, I create a lot of images that are very similar to one another. So with these lenses, I'm either at 24, which is nice and wide, or I'm at 85, which is that nice telephoto. On a 24 to 70, I'll shoot one image at 24, and then 28, and then 32, and then 45, and everything kind of blends together as one, and there's no distinct separation. With primes, I feel like every single image has pop. The quality of glass you can get also uh, for the dollar spent is usually a lot better as well. And just the three-dimensionality and the pop that comes from the images as well as the, the emotion that kind of can come out of that, I feel like is really accentuated by primes. Again, play around with what you like. If you like zooms, if you find the convenience of that outweigh the negatives, then that is totally cool for you as well. The last lens that I have here is the 70 to 200 f2.8. And this is the lens that I use for ceremonies. So this will be on my camera body pretty much all day. This will be on my second camera body all day or a 35 millimeter lens. And this 7200 is a lens that will be on my camera for a wedding ceremony. And the reason I use a zoom for that is simply because I don't want to be too obtrusive to the day. So I want to be able to zoom around rather than running around within a ceremony trying to get the shots that I need. And it does an incredible job. If you are interested in having something like a 70 to 200 f2.8, they're very expensive. But one thing that you can do is you can rent them. There are a lot of companies around, depending on where you live in the world, in Canada or the States. Um, I know that there's definitely some in Australia and all through Europe. But you can just rent lenses and they will get shipped directly to you and they'll show up in a Pelican case and you can use them for the weekend. Uh, or you can just rent them to do portfolio shoots and step up your portfolio. So this is a lens that is almost necessary. I would consider it to be a necessary lens in a bigger wedding environment. Smaller wedding, 10, 15, 20 people outside on a beach. Uh, you can definitely get away with the 85, but any time that I find myself in a church or any time that I find myself just with 150, 200 people around, I definitely want to be using the 70 to 200. Now with all of these lenses, there are the professional kind of top of the line versions as well as less expensive versions. And quite honestly, a lot of the lesser cost versions are almost as good as all of the professional line, as long as you're in the right lighting conditions. Where the more expensive professional glass really steps ahead is when you find yourself in really challenging environments or really weird lighting or you have spotlights coming down the barrel of your lens. In those cases specifically, you'll find the professional glass does a lot better of a job of handling it. But at the same time, for the cost spent, if it's not a lens that you use all the time, it's not worth investing the $2,000 to get something like this when you can get by with something like, for instance, um, if you're shooting a digital SLR still, you're able to go in the back catalog of Canon and Nikon and find those lenses that they released maybe in the early 2000s or even before. In the case of Nikon, you can use glass from the 70s. It'll just be manual focus. Uh, you can find those lenses and you can find, for Nikon, it's called D-Glass. And those are the lenses, the 85 and the 35 F2D that I started on. And quite honestly, today, I would still be happy to use them. Um, again, there are situations where this will definitely st step ahead, but at the same time, you're, you're gonna be saving a lot of money. So uh, figure out which lenses you actually wanna be using. There are all kinds of lenses in between all of these focal lengths, but I've just discovered that 85 is the place that I like to be the most because sim I guess simply because I'm introverted and quiet and shy and I find it a little bit difficult if I was shooting all day on a 35. I don't wanna get that close to people. 85 is more my comfort zone when it comes to that. So those are wedding photography lenses. Uh, what I would recommend, 
getting a wide angle lens of some sort, 35 or 24, as well as an 85 to get started. You can save a lot of money not getting the really expensive 24 to 70 f 2.8s and you can really get on your way a lot faster and start creating better images than you would say if you're using the kit lens or a 24 to 70 f4 or an 18 to 200 um, 3.5 to 5.6 or something like that. So definitely rent the lenses that you think you might want or just buy the, the cheaper versions of them and, and see where your limits are before deciding to invest more in the future because there's definitely some lenses that I purchased that I thought were going to be the lens that I was going to use for everything and as it turns out um, I really just didn't enjoy it as much as, as the lenses that I've really stuck with since beginning my wedding photography career. So thanks for watching today and if you have not yet heard I'm moving all of my content from Patreon over to my own website. I found that Patreon was difficult in a few ways. The main one being that if you signed up on the 28th of the month that you would be charged again on the first of the month, which is really annoying. Um, and also with the new website, all of the content is essentially course-based. So you sign up, you get instant access to all the courses that I've created. And on Patreon, they are very difficult to, to track and to put in an easy to use way. Uh, whereas now on the new website, it's just very, very simple for you to come in and immediately start accessing all the courses. Uh, there's a lot on there. There's $2,000 plus worth of stuff. Uh, the highlights might be the off-camera flash course that is very important for wedding photographers to learn and approach master. I'm not gonna say master because I don't think anyone will ever get to, to mastery, but to start your journey, uh, as well as the introvert's guide to posing and a lot of other things, including a pricing course and book more weddings. There's three different years of that and three different um, iterations of that, as well as all the future content that comes. And if you are watching this in July of 2020, that likely means that there are still a few spots available for the founder offer, which basically means if you're a founding member, you can sign up annually and you can get all of this for $6.58 a month, which is absolutely crazy. Uh, so you can sign up and as long as you're one of the first hundred, you can get that. So hopefully that's still available. And I will see you again another time from the patio here. It's very blue. How's the, how's the color cast on my face here? Is that nice? You can barely see it. Oh. Well, shout out to Fuji for handling the weird white balance exceptionally well. Maybe. I haven't seen it. Tim, good, man. It Tim says like it looks good. It looks like, Tim like says it looks like film. Thanks for watching. See you again next time.